All right, we are going to move into our next panel, which is on network neutrality. Uh, to get us started, can you raise your hand in, in this room if you know what network if you know what ne network neutrality is? Okay, good. Well, that's good. Good. So we can uh, we can have a mix of a fruitful conversation and uh, hopefully bring everyone else up to speed. If you're here in the last panel, you get a sense that new media, the internet, and the web are very important vehicles to getting issues that are undercovered in the mainstream media out to people, out to activists, out to citizens, out to community members. Um, but what we know is that the internet as we know it now, the internet that we enjoy, how it's free and open, you can kind of plug your own applications into it and try new things, is under threat. There are uh, uh, any number of gatekeepers who have an interest in sort of uh, locking down, uh, putting walls around uh, sections of the internet, and controlling and creating tiered pricing for, for what we can access now um, generally. So that is the issue that we're going to discuss in the next panel. I'm going to take a quick peek piece, uh, behind stage to see how we're doing with our panelists. Yeah, we're ready to send them out. Yeah, great. Thank you for their patience. I don't have any appropriate jokes. Does anyone in the audience have an appropriate joke about net neutrality? How many telecom operators does it take to know? Um, Harold, you got a you got a joke, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> you will discover she will treat you right. See, we're just about ready. Some of our last folks are getting wired with their microphones. While we're waiting, I'll go ahead and introduce you to who we're going to be hearing from today. We're going to see uh, Josh Silver. He's the ex executive director for Free Press, which is a large national organization working on net neutrality, media diversity. Uh, with a new campaign, Internet for Everyone, they're going to be uh, launching uh, a large national dialogue on how we bring people to the table to find out how we can connect people who are not, uh, who do not have access to the Internet. So we're going to have uh, Josh Silver here up in, here in a minute. Matt Stoller is the president of Blog Pack and a regular blogger uh, at Open Left. He's uh, very involved in the net neutrality debates. And we'll also have Adam, Adam Green, who's the civic communications director at Move On. Move On has been a, uh, an active and regular participant in the debates over net neutrality. Uh, they're, as you probably know, they, they're member driven and uh, they have found consistently that the, their Move On members understand net neutrality and uh, it's important and they've been able to mobilize thousands of people around that. So we've got a couple of our panelists. Thanks. So we're just going to wait for Adam. I see he's right there. All right, thanks a lot, Adam. So we're going to start with, uh, with uh, Josh. He's going to uh, sort of set up uh, the context, explain what net neutrality is and why it's important to everybody here. Okay. No, not yet. Let me know when we're, when we're live. Good. Hi, folks. So uh, I don't know if everybody noticed when Adam Green came out, he actually thought he was in a rock concert. <laughs> And he waved his hands, and nobody replied. So, can we have a big, a big good morning to Adam Green? Just to thank you. It makes him feel, it makes him feel better. So, uh, can, I'd like to get a show of hands. Who here in this, in this tent, has followed the net neutrality debate at all? Okay. Who here? Now, if you just raise your hand, you don't have to raise your hand again. Who here has a clue what net neutrality is and why it matters? Good. They say know your audience. Okay, thanks for that, Jim. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk for like five minutes about what ne net neutrality is and why it matters, and then these guys are going to talk about more interesting things. But basically, uh, net neutrality is a very simple concept that actually dates back really till 1934. Back then when the, the U.S. government created the Federal Communications Commission and telephones were being uh, uh, wired into homes. 
It was something called common carriage, which basically said, if you have a phone, nobody can tell you what to do with that phone. You can call your grandmother, you can call your cousin, you can say what you want. It's an open, neutral network that is free for you. You can use it as a dial-up modem when computers were created. The phone company cannot tell you what you do with it. Net neutrality is the modern version of that. Net neutrality is a law that essentially says that the cable and phone companies, which control 98% of high-speed internet connections in this country, I'm going to say that again, cable and phone companies control 98% of, of connections of high-speed internet, cannot control and slow down digital content like movies or, or blogs or emails based upon who is sending it. Now, did everybody catch that? Because that's an important point. There's a huge debate happening in net neutrality around what, what is reasonable network management. If you're Comcast or AT&T and your network is overly clogged with information because so many people are watching YouTube, <clears throat> what is reasonable for them to do in terms of managing their network? It gets very wonky and very complicated very fast, but the simple thing for you to know is the debate over net neutrality says that if if Adam works for ABC News, which thankfully he doesn't, and Matt is working out of his house with his own little blog, that their video and their content are going to move up into the internet and across the internet at the exact same speed. And that is what's crucial about the internet. That is what is allowed uh, folks like Google and folks like most of the amazing uh, innovations that have happened on the web have happened in garages by college students. And if, it, if not for a neutral network, they would not have been able to pay the premiums that they would need to have the fast lane access to the web that the cable and phone companies are trying to achieve. So I have about one more minute. So what I'm going to tell you is what happened about uh, two years ago is nothing short of, of a miracle. Uh, if we go back three years ago, the Federal Communications Commission made a bad decision and effectively took net neutrality off of the law books by basically, and I'm not going to get into why, but because of the entry of cable companies into the internet market, they did that. The, the Supreme Court in the same year, in 2005, kind of uh, condoned that decision. Then in 2006, the Republican-led Congress and White House tried to pass a law, a major telecommunications law, that would have forever abolished net neutrality. And what happened at that point was nothing short of remarkable, and that's what these guys are going to talk about. And after they do that, we're going to circle back out of the history phase of this presentation, and we're going to talk about what's happening now and what's going to happen next. Great, we're going to move on to Adam. Uh, we're going to ask you, uh, we know that your Move On members have been really engaged in this issue, so if you can talk to us about how you made that message clear to them and how that, why they've gotten engaged, that'd be great. Hello. Hello. So, yeah, two, two years ago, two years ago, uh, net neutrality was really in limbo. It had been the law of the land forever, and essentially, Congress had a choice. They could pass a really, really bad bill that Josh alluded to that would have permanently taken net neutrality off the books, or they could have done what we wanted, which was permanently put it back on the, the books, or they could do, do nothing kick the ball down the road and allow us to fight for a better day. All the conventional wisdom was that net neutrality was going to be taken off the books. And there was an initial vote in a House committee, and the vote was 23 to 8 against net neutrality. Every single Republican except for one voted against net neutrality, and even half the Democrats voted against net neutrality, mostly because people were not aware of this issue. And if a Verizon lobbyist or a Comcast lobbyist comes into your office and says, hey, you should vote for this, and you have no other side there, then uh, they, vote, they vote for it. Uh, at the end of the day, to fast forward, the bill died. And we're currently back in this state where there's not really a permanence and we're fighting to get net neutrality permanently on the book. But as Josh said, an amazing thing happened between that starting point, 23 to 8 vote, and this bill completely uh, going down. And that was, the, that was people power. That was the involvement of over 1 million everyday Americans who, most of whom had never heard of this issue before, getting involved in this process and holding their politicians accountable. Um, our initial challenge on the move on side, you know, we have over 3 million members on an email list. Um, most of whom are everyday folks, 
They work full-time jobs. They care about issues, but they have a limited, limited amount of time to get involved. Our initial uh, challenge was to make this issue real to people, let them know what was at stake. So our point was that Move On itself never could have gotten off the ground if the internet was not a level playing field. You know, a guy named Craig who once had a list was able to become Craigslist because of net neutrality, the ability of the little guy to compete on an even playing field. Um, and little guy blogs and all sorts of little guy innovators are allowed to get into it. Also, I don't know how many people here use iTunes, but I use iTunes for my I iPod, iPhone, and I also have Comcast as a um, cable provider. Well, Comcast has their own online music sharing site. And in a non-net neutrality world, what Comcast could essentially do is say, iTunes will work very slowly on my computer. Comcast's ver version of iTunes will work very, very fast. And essentially skew the entire marketplace you know, to, to self-deal. So the economic marketplace online would be rigged if net neutrality was gone. The marketplace of ideas, the online public square, which MoveOn participates, would be rigged. And that's how we made this real to our members. We started with an online petition. Free Press did as well, as did Common Cause and other groups. And at the end of the day, about 1.6 million people signed it. And then we started putting phone calls into members of Congress. And actually, one thing that stands out in my mind, the week after this initial 23 to 8 vote, there, were, um, there was like a cor congressional recess, and a member of Congress from Michigan named Bart Stupak went home and held a town hall meeting in this little, little part of his district, very remote part. We e emailed our members at the very, very last minute, and we said, can you please go to this meeting and ask about this issue of net neutrality? Ask him why he voted against net neutrality. Three out of 12 questions at that meeting were about net neutrality. He probably was not prepared for that. <laughs> Two weeks later, there was another vote, and four Democrats who had initially voted against net neutrality voted for it. Several Democrats who had been on the fence came off the fence and voted for it, and the margin started to move in our direction. Months and months went by. We put phone calls in over and over again. Um, uh, what we saw was little guys all across the internet making YouTube videos, video gamers, Football players who wanted their clips on, U on YouTube to be able to pa be passed around freely. Uh, wrestling sites who also wanted to be able to see, see clips of wrestling online freely. Um, all these people that aren't usually involved in politics started making YouTube videos and getting the, their communities involved in this fight. And then the, the real cornerstone of our effort was in August of 2006. Uh, this is a time when members go home for an entire month. They're not ensconced by lobbyists anymore. They go back to the people. And what we did with Free Press and others like Common Cause was we had 25 petition delivery events around the country. We took these 1.6 million signatures, chopped them into congressional districts and states, delivered to each member of Congress who we were targeting, a member of the Senate, their local constituents who stood on our side of the issue. And we essentially gave them a heads up in advance. We're like, we will um, either you know, have kind of an angry rally saying, you know, why won't you support net neutrality? Or we will thank you if you come out for net neutrality. And that month, six U.S. senators who had been off, on the fence came off the fence in favor of net neutrality. Um, we had 25 really successful media event, events around the country with local news stations who, you know, never had heard of, heard of net neutrality before, were covering, um, covering this people-powered movement back home. And at the end of the day, you know, we won lots of votes this way, and um, the bill died in the Senate. They simply did not have enough votes to bring it up for a vote and pass it. Um, so now we're in a state of limbo. But what has happened here is kind of a sleeping giant has been awoke, awakened, and there are a lot more people involved in these internet freedom issues. And net neutrality is really the first of many. We can get into more. But that's kind of how citizens have gotten involved in this fight, and it kind of proves at the end of the day that the little guy really can make a difference, especially in this internet-driven, people-powered world. Great, Matt. So tell us uh, about net neutrality, for, I guess, uh, from the blogger's point of view. Hello. Uh, you, you should be fine. Try it out. Can, can, you, can you hear me? OK. okay. Um, so uh, Bernie Ebers, you guys know Bernie Ebers? Is he head of WorldCom? MCI? What? He's in jail, right. M oh, sorry, MCI. Um, uh, you guys heard of Global Crossing? The uh, massive telecom, what? Oh, OK. The multi-billion dollar uh, shareholder fraud in telecommunications industry. What about Adelphia? Cable, cable. You pick your best, um, your favorite fraud. Uh, and there's some, there's some chance, not, you know, because there's so much corporate fraud nowadays, but there's some chance it'll end up in the telecommunications or cable industry. Um, Bernie Ebers is one of the ones who went to jail. But there's so many who didn't. And they're still running things. I'm going to give you a sense of who these people are, the people that want to control the internet, why that's important. 
So Ed Whitaker is a former CEO of AT&T. And I think what will give you a sense of who this guy is, I want to tell you about his hobby. He, uh, he's in, he lives in Texas. And, and his hobby is going home to his ranch. I'm not kidding. Going home to his ranch and clearing brush. That's what he enjoys doing in his spare time. Now, as a general rule of thumb, I think that giving uh, Texas Republicans uh, who like to clear brush in their spare time control of vital American institutions is a bad idea. I don't know, it's just sort of made I'm generalizing, but that's, that's sort of just my general rule of thumb. Ed Whitaker is the former CEO of AT&T. And he had a statement that came out in, I think it was 2005, where he said the internet, all these companies, Google and, and these, these bloggers, they think they're going to make money on our pipes. He called them our pipes. These are the pipes going to your home, delivering uh, the websites and the email and video that you use on the internet. And he called them our pipes. This is who is wants to be in control of the internet content that you use. And one thing that's important to know is that Right now, these people are dividing up the next generation of communication platforms, all media, all movies, um, all telephone service, all mobile phone service, all cable service. That's all going to go over the internet. Everything we're talking about in terms of every medium, every way that you communicate with anybody who's not in the same room with you, every, all content you consume will go over the internet. And right now, that vital path to democracy is, um, is being debated. That's really what net neutrality is about. And on one side is people like us, and on the other side are Republicans from Texas who like to clear brush, destroy, you know, you know with, with chainsaws and whatnot. That, that's, that's sort of the, the, the aesthetic dynamic of the fight. Um, and it's important to understand that this is an industry rife with fraud and criminals stealing money from shareholders. Um, because this is not a story about technology, and it's not even a story about policy. It's a story about democracy. The net neutrality fight really started, I think, in 2003, when this country went to war uh, based on lies. And uh, three million people wrote the FCC in 2003 um, because they were angry about a media consolidation rule that Michael Powell, son of Colin Powell, um, and head of the FCC, wanted to relax. And the, the details of that are not important. What's important is that three million people wrote the FCC basically because they were so angry about being lied to by the media um, around the issue of the war in Iraq. And that's really what gave the popular impulse to these issues of media. Because the public gets that media is fundamental to our democracy. So if you roll that forward a, a few years, and we did end up defeating that media relaxation rule because of three million people writing the FCC, um, in 2006, when these uh, same people tried to take over the internet, um, we were able to start the net neutrality movement. And the net neutrality movement is about providing universal broadband and really sort of removing the power of these criminals to dominate the content that, that we can um, interact with. Now, from a movement perspective, and I'm a, a progressive movement guy, uh, consider myself more of that than a Democrat, um, what's important here is to understand why we've been successful, because we have been successful. A few um, weeks ago, there was a decision handed down punishing Comcast, not for saying, um, can you wait in your home from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. while we come by and not fix your cable, which I would like them punished for that, but that wasn't the order. Um, but for, for throttling content that people wanted to use. Uh, that's very significant, because it's the first time these guys have been punished for anything in, in a really, really long time. And it's also a significant win for net neutrality to protect the internet. We also pulled a Republican FCC chairman over onto our side. Um, we've been successful. We've actually been able to govern as a progressive movement around progressive policies with both the Republican Congress in 2006 and a very conservative Democratic Congress in 2008 and a, and a Republican president. We didn't have to wait for a Democratic president to start governing on this issue because we were able to build the structures to actually do it. And that, the reason we were able to do that is because we have a clear rationale. Free speech and democracy is really important, not that complicated. And we were able to work with um, progressive businesses, um, businesses that see their value, uh, see the immense value created around the internet, things like Google and eBay and uh, Amazon. 
We were able to work in agencies like the FCC, we were able to work in Congress, and we were able to have this immense grassroots movement to actually uh, provide the popular sentiment behind this move for greater democracy. Now, as we move forward, what we've seen is that while we've had success on the net neutrality front and on providing broadband and, and really kind of giving voice to millions of people in this country through these tools, we've, we've had failures too, most significantly around the wiretapping um, of, that these telecoms have engaged in. And as we move forward, all of these issues, all of media is converging, but all of these issues are converging as well, is these people who are really, who want to throttle not just the internet, not just file sharing, but they want to throttle democracy, we're going to have to fight them going forward. And we're going to need all of your help um, to do that. So really this is a contest between these sort of authoritarians who are running our communication networks, who think they own our communication networks, and the public itself, and these new businesses, and labor, and people who understand the importance of free speech and, and, um, and debate. And that's really what this whole fight is about. So as you move forward, um, that's sort of the piece that I, wanna, I want you to take from this. All right, thanks a lot. I think uh, we've laid the groundwork so that everyone, if they came to this room again, they could raise their hand and say they know what net neutrality is, they know why it matters. With that, we want to return back to Josh and uh, sort of tell us about what is the, the cutting edge, the state of play on these questions and uh, how they're going to connect to the broader public interest uh, internet agenda over the next couple of years. Uh, you, that was great, you guys, and, and, and also just from the, the, the most meta level, the part I left out, and I think these guys covered it really well, is, you know, this really is the most, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb, this is the most important issue facing our country. It, in that, the failure of journalism is so acute at this point in the mainstream commercial press, the extent to which they treat the election that this week is all about as a horse race and fail to actually turn over the stones and find out does the rhetoric match the policy. The extent to which the, the whole game is being treated as such and that we have tens, nearly hundreds of millions of Americans, but certainly tens of millions of Americans who feel completely alienated from the political process and that it is a completely corrupt system, which it is, thanks to money and politics, that this idea that the internet is going to take television and radio and phone service and emerging technologies and it's going to be the delivery mechanism for all media other than the printed page, the idea that every single website will soon be able to have the capacity to be a TV or a radio network, that's the most profound paradigm shift in the history of media. And so the whether or not that will be realized, whether or not you will have the ability to realize that dream, or whether or not the cable and phone companies will have the ability to squash it, is really what this debate's all about. And when you understand that, you realize why this campaign we're talking about is arguably the most successful net roots campaign in the history of our country. And you realize why it also makes a logical sense because people who are stuck behind computers and obsessed with blogs inherently, intrinsically understand what's at stake and their own self-interest in it. Now very quickly, uh, we fought them to a draw in 2006 with the Telecommunications Act. We, as Matt mentioned, we won an important fight at the FCC with the vote of a GOP, you know, a Bush, a guy who Kevin Martin, with, uh, who heads the FCC, who was one of the lawyers who was behind the, the, the vote recount in Florida in 2000. This guy is a hard right winger who actually went the right way on this thanks to his desire to have a political career and the amount of noise that Matt and Adam and the rest of the net roots created. Barack Obama supports net neutrality. John McCain doesn't. John McCain has a rich career of doing exactly what the biggest phone companies ask him to do at every single turn in his career. There's not a single moment in John McCain's career that he's been a maverick. Now, he hasn't really been a maverick on much other than a few token issues that at the end of the day he doesn't actually stand up for. So the maverick thing I don't, still don't understand. Uh, Barack Obama has people around him who are good on net neutrality, but the point I want to make before I turn it back over to Adam, and I would like to get audience participation, is that this debate goes far beyond net neutrality. 
net neutrality we've described. There's a whole other set of policy issues that will come before the Congress and the Federal Communications Commission over the next few years that are going to be the game changers. There are things like something you've never heard of called the Universal Service Fund, except Harold, he's heard of it. And it's currently got over six, okay, good, it's a few people. It's got over six billion dollars sitting at it. It's the fund that was the key to getting telephone service built out to rural and poor communities uh, across the country for the last many decades. We need to get the Universal Service Fund, the obvious move, to be paying for build out of broadband to those communities. We have to do other things like free up wireless white spaces, the areas in between the TV and radio dial. Um, and th that's a whole other technical list. But from that point of view, there's going to be a lot of action in the Congress and the FCC over the next two years. We have a law that was introduced by Congressman Markey from Massachusetts that is actually working its way through the Congress, but we don't expect to pass this year. It will certainly come up next year. There is going to be a whole new movement behind a, a visionary and progressive uh, legislative agenda, and we're going to need you, and we're going to need about a million other people like you to get behind it. Adam? Sorry. This is what happens in a non neutrality world right here. We get silenced. Um, so, you know, one, one question that, you know, Move On thinks about a lot is what do we do post-November? Now, assuming we have a Democratic president and Democratic Congress, what is the role of movement organizations? And, you know, the, the role, the answer is, you know, to hold politicians accountable and make sure those who campaigned on our issues actually implement. Uh, there was actually a very significant moment a few months ago. Uh, Barack Obama was doing an MTV MySpace forum, and a website called 10questions.com uh, essentially allowed people to submit YouTube questions for candidates, and whichever ones got the most votes, those, the top 10 questions would be submitted to all the candidates in the primary. And MTV cut a deal where essentially whatever one question was up top at a certain date at a certain time would get asked to Barack Obama in this forum. So one of our members submitted a net neutrality question. It got asked. And the question was, um, will you pledge to make net neutrality a priority during your first year in office? And will you only appoint FCC commissioners who support open internet principles? And Barack Obama uh, gave an emphatic yes. He then gave a very, very eloquent nearly two-minute answer about what net neutrality was and really in had internalized the issue and was very eloquent on it. Um, but we need to make sure that he actually follows through during the first year in office. It's very easy for things to get left off the plate, and we can't afford for this to get left off the plate. So what's the role of all the people in, the, in, this, in this room? Well, when we meet politicians, including Democratic members of Congress at various breakfasts or wherever we are, um, we should ask them, you know, will you support net neutrality when Barack Obama brings it up next Congress? If they don't understand it, we need to explain it to them because them hearing from you is really the counter to them hearing from lobbyists in Washington, D.C. And we need to make a commitment now on this issue and on other progressive issues we care about to hold Barack Obama accountable and Democratic politicians accountable in 2009 to make sure that they not just know that we're rooting for them, but that we are an army willing to go to bat for them in our communities. We care about these issues. We'll get their back if they're bold and they think big. Um, so that's really what we're focusing on and that we hope everyone else will focus on as well. So we have time for, uh, for a good uh, long Q&A. And so again, we're going to need uh, uh, some help from our, sta uh, from our staff uh, with the roving mic. Um, and but just to get us started, I, I, we're, you know, we're talking uh, the, the last panel about how the mainstream media covers a number of issues. And a consistent theme in mainstream media coverage of net neutrality to the degree that they do is that it's a clash of giants between you know, the old AT&T and the new Google. And oftentimes I, you, know, you see a, a de-emphasizing of the net roots of the sort of you know, focused work that, that people are doing at every level. And how, how do we deal with that? How, well, I mean, I think you know, all of you have will probably have a comment on, to, on that. And, do you see it changing or, you know? Well, I mean, in general, the press doesn't like to talk about grassroots action because they're corrupt and um, should be destroyed. But, um, you know, Google um, and uh, Amazon and eBay, they really didn't do very much in 2005, 2006. They're actually a lot like the um, sort of feckless Democratic Party leadership, which doesn't actually believe in fighting. And um, they've gotten a little bit better. But the telecoms and cable companies are conservative organizations that go after and seek to destroy their opponents. Whereas the, these new businesses are constantly trying to prove that they're right. And it's kind of adorable and ridiculous. Um, the press doesn't understand 
that um, they, don't, they don't understand how to tell the story of the, the meeting that Adam talked about with Bart Stupak. Uh, they don't understand and they don't respect the public. So they're not going to actually tell the story about how the public actually cares about this issue. It is inconceivable to a journalist uh, or a traditional journalist that the public might actually care about public policy um, because they don't care about public policy. Uh, and uh, so it's actually a, a, a big challenge here. But in, in, in it gets back to one of the issues that we haven't talked about, which is media ownership, um, which is part of what we're talking about here. Because as all media converges and goes into the internet, I mean, we know who owns media right now. Um, and it's not us. And it's not diverse. And it's not, it's not gender diverse. Um, and they're not going to cover this issue. And they're just, because they don't fundamentally believe that this is about um, public participation in the political process. They're going to continue to frame it as a clash of, um, of giants, a clash of business interests. Uh, and that's just an organizing problem that we're going to have to overcome. And we were able to successfully overcome it. If you talk to anyone on Capitol Hill, they'll say, yeah, Google didn't really matter in 2005, 2006. It was all grassroots action. And so we have to continue that and realize that the press is just not going to cover this issue. They don't care about it. They can't conceive that the public might be interested about it. But the internet press, the, um, the blogosphere, the um, uh, the, the, the new media, they will cover it and they can actually frame this as the, the moral issue that it really is about. Do you, do you want to comment on that as well? I just, I just want to point out one thing around the elephant in the room. It's always a little weird when a major corporation is sponsoring a tent and there's public interest groups and well what's the real deal? Are the public interest groups looking askew at anything? Because the reality is is that on 99% of Google's positions on policy on internet they're in the right place. And it's not out of altruism. It's because they want their product to be accessible to every home in America. And the reality is, is that only about 55% of homes in America have high-speed internet. Google wants that to increase for their commerce. We want that to increase for democracy. Google can live with a neutral network and maintain their business model. We need a neutral network to maintain journalistic integrity and democracy. There are an issue like, for example, privacy, where there are divergences with the public interest community, but for the most part, they're good. Great. Do you want to add anything to that? OK, great. Let's uh, move to q and uh, You have your mic. OK, excellent. One quick question. Is there a relationship between net neutrality and the government's ownership of uh, of the net of, of the World Wide Web. In other words, because DARPA created, you know, this technology, my understanding is then the U.S. controls all that and can say to some other country what they can or cannot do or shut them down. Am I in error about that? You know, that whole discussion. Yeah, actually, the, the backbone of the U.S. Internet, the backbone is owned by major corporations, not the government. But it's a good point. It was U.S. government funds that actually created the internet, <clears throat> supported those universities, and the US is the birthplace of the internet. And it's interesting how the cable and phone companies with their 98% duopoly always hide behind this sort of uh, far right rhetoric of you know ha government hands off, let the free market prevail when there's been no such thing as a, as a, a free market when it comes to the birth of the internet. We have a mic out there. Um, we have a question up front here. Thank you. She, uh, he's coming with a mic for you right now. Yeah, there you go. Oh, hi. Um, uh, Anne Yang with Newtown Dynasty TV. We are a non-governmental Chinese language uh, American TV network based in New York. Uh, my question, just now somebody, uh, you know, talked about uh, Google and this kind of tech company. Uh, uh, there are by and large doing a good job. Uh, my question is related to my audience because most of my audience are in China. And you know Google in China, they offered a censored version for the internet user there. And uh, uh, although maybe Google is re uh, refusing the US government, but they're not uh, giving out the uh, privacy the information about the user, checking out the pornography website. But they are bowing to the Beijing government by offering a censored uh, website, and also Yahoo and all the other uh, tech companies. Do you think uh, this net neutrality of uh, uh, internet uh, topic is only you know, limited to here in the United States, or we should include all the countries? 
Thank you. But, yeah, I'll take it. Uh, the, these debates, actually, it's, it's interesting you say that because most other countries operate neutral networks. And it's, it's actually the, the debate in the United States has actually brought this issue of not, the idea of a non-neutral network into the debate in other countries much more than it had been previously. Now, an interesting note is the kind of censorship that you described on the internet in China the technology used by the Chinese government to do that is very similar to the kind of technology that Comcast was caught using just uh, earlier, oh, actually at the end of last year, and punished for by the FCC this year. So there are parallels here. You alluded to Google's practice on privacy in China. It's a perfect example of where we, the public interest community, strongly disagree with Google. Uh, but the, the fact is, is that most other countries have broadband speeds and competition that are absolutely blow us away. I mean, we, are, we have sunk from, the United States has sunk from fifth in the year 2000 in broadband adoption and speed to 16th globally. And it's because we don't have competition. Uh, in those markets, if in France, for example, if you want to get triple play, cable, phone, and internet service at your house, you can have often, even in a rural place, six or seven options of competitors because of government policies that ensure a competitive market. So what happens there is also a self-regulating system where if one of those internet service providers actually is not abiding by net neutrality, you actually have a choice where you can say, well, I'm going to go to another service provider because they run a neutral network. So competition also helps uh, fi fix the net neutrality issue. Of course, there's not much competition in China. I believe we have uh, time for one more question. So raise your hand if you've got one. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, you've talked about corporations that have an interest in seeing non-net neutrality, and you've talked about disinterested corporations. What corporation can you identify, say 25 billion, 50 billion, annual earnings or larger that has an interest in net neutrality? Pretty much every single company in this country that relies on the web for their business model. And that is why, okay, here goes the big pitch. That's why we just launched internetforeveryone.org. And if you could just write that down, because I don't want to have to say it like 10 times. Internetforeveryone.org is actually an effort to speak to exactly what you're asking. It's a very smart question. That is the only companies in corporate America with an interest against net neutrality are the owners of the networks. Yeah, eBay. E eBay is on board. Google's on board. Yahoo. The Consumer uh, Electronics Association. Uh, a, a growing list, but essentially, and they're tentative to jump in, but they're doing it slowly. If you go to internetforeveryone.org, uh, you'll see a full list. But what we're going to see, if, if those of us on stage and you are successful in the next year, we are going to literally see thousands of major corporations, including finance, travel, real estate, gamers. All of these companies that rely on the web are going to, to sidle up next to the public interest community because their business model stands to gain from open, ubiquitous internet. I, I want to get to the China question a little bit more, because I think it's, an, it's a really interesting question. In general, um, it's important to establish that Censoring the internet or throttling, doing whatever Comcast or AT&T want to do, or whatever the Chinese government wants to do, is a violation of international norms. That it's a it's an authoritarian approach to managing a society. I, I don't think that that concept has been established. Um, that what Comcast is doing and what the Chinese government are doing is the same thing. We have to establish that in this country um, and all over the world, and that. I think the, I'm not an expert on international relations, but you have to put, you, you have to be clean, you know, clean in your own area before you can make claims about, um, about other countries. And so we have to establish that here and then make the case that China should open up and stop engaging in censorship and authoritarian practices against their own, their own people. Yeah, and just to go back to that last question about companies, what Matt said before wasn't that uh, company, Google wasn't interested in the issue. What he said was that they, they didn't step up at a key moment the way they could have maximally stepped up. But, but just to repeat, pretty much everybody except for the Verizon and Comcast of the world are impacted by net neutrality. And the people who led our events on the ground that I described before, one guy was a guy named Gary Maracle who runs NewMexicoChile.com. He's a small business owner. 
and it, he didn't want big companies to be, have an have a advantage on the web compared to his small business. He wanted to be able to essentially have his website be seen equally to the big guys so he could compete based on price, not based on web speed. Um, but there's also, this is a key point, the innovators of the future are, are those most affected by this. And this fundamentally impacts a progressive agenda. There's a whole realm of, of inventions being made right now that are essentially plugins to your cell phone. One example that I've heard, I think actually from Matt, is somebody's working on something, essentially you would plug it into your cell phone, it would use the wireless capabilities of your cell phone and allow you to scan barcodes in a supermarket so that you can know, do those companies give health care to the workers? Do they pay the minimum wage? Do they have good health and, health and safety standards? Uh, do they give to Democrats or Republicans? Imagine a world where progressives could vote with our dollars because we had access to this information that is being freed up through the internet and through new technology. A world, right now, the companies can cripple those things from working on these cell phones, but the ramifications for progressives are huge to free that up. And one final point has to do with, well, what happens if John McCain gets elected? You know, the last big economic boom in our country was when? The 90s, during the internet, right? John McCain uh, says that he does not use a computer, he says he is technologically illiterate. He talks about a Google. He talks about how the staff is trying to change, uh, uh, train him to watch blogs, as if watching you watch a blog, right? This is not a guy who can trust with the future of our technology and the future of our economy, which is so pivotal to the future of our progressive agenda. So that's just a little bit of big picture analysis for this convention that we're at right now. And thank you all for being the ones who are in this room listening to these issues. It's a great way to wrap it up. Uh, big round of applause. Thanks a lot. We're going to ask Josh Silver to, uh, to hang out and introduce our, our keynote speaker. Okay, great. And uh, we'll uh, exit the stage and make room for that. So great, thank thanks. you.